is everybody here? Okay, good. Uh, I think we can start. Okay, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon everyone. To bless our training session this afternoon, let us recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah, uh, we get together this afternoon virtually in the academic training with the title Fundamental of Rubrics for Assessment with Professor Dr. Wong Suluan, Professor at Faculty of Educational Study, University of uh, Putra, Malaysia. My name is Dr. Nafati Masjid Sulaiman and I am a lecturer at the Faculty of Business, Economics and Social Development, UMT. Okay, so I will be serving as your moderator today. You will be hearing an academic training session from Prof uh, on this very timely subject. But before we get started, I want to get uh, I want to take a few minutes of your time. Okay, on behalf of everyone, I would like to express deep get, uh, gratitude to the Center for Talent Development and Innovation (PPBI UMT) for their efforts to provide us with timely topics and a very prominent speaker, Prof here with, uh, with us. Okay, so this session will introduce the participant to the fundamental of rub uh, rubrics for assessment. 21st century educators not only need to be creative and innovative in teaching learning, but also competent in assessing the intended learning outcome, LOs, of a course. Okay, to assess the intended LOs objectively and holistically, a, rub a rubric is a powerful tool to use. So, what is a rubric? Okay, so it is a tool comprising a set of criteria with possible levels of performance quality on the criteria developed to assess any kind of student work. Okay, from written to oral uh, to visual. The focus of this uh, workshop is on rubrics for student learning and to help you design and create a rubric that will benefit you as an educator and also your student. Before we continue this session, I would like to inform you that we will be hearing the uh, session from uh, the speaker followed by Q&A session. If there are any questions, suggestions or view, please submit them in the chat room or you can unmute yourself. I also would like to remind all, please mute your microphone when not speaking. Now, uh, moving along to our session. Okay, please welcome Prof. Dr. Wong Suluan who will be speaking to us on fundamental of rubrics for assessment. Okay, Professor uh, Wong uh, Suluan is currently a professor at Department of Science and Technical Education, Faculty of Educational Study, UPM. She is currently the Senior Associate Editor for the Asia Pacific Education Researcher, ISI Thomson Reuters and the Editor-in-Chief of Botanica Journal of Social Science and Humanities. Uh, she was the President of Asia Pacific Society of Computers in Education. She has an H-Index of 35 in Google Scholar and her H-Index is in Scopus is 18. She has led uh, and joined several research grants at a national and international level. Her research interests are in the area of interest-driven learning, integration of IT into pre-service, teacher and in-service teacher education, teaching and learning with IT, constructivism in IT, and also instrument development. Okay, so... Um, all right, Prof, uh, the platform is yours. Thank you, Dr. Fatima, for the introduction. I'm so glad to be able to join this session and be with you this afternoon. First of all, let me just share my slides first. Just give me a minute. It will take uh, a few seconds. So when it's on the screen, can you just please let me know? On my slide, you can see the QR code. Uh, that's where you can access my slide, which is in PDF form. Okay, is it visible to you? Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fatima. Let me put it in presentation mode. 
All right. That's my email address. If you'd like to contact me, sulon at upm.edu.my. I am from the Faculty of Educational Studies. What will happen today is a sharing session. I believe I am not here to teach you, but to share with you my experience using rubrics and my examples. Most of my examples would be education centric, meaning that I would be using my, my discipline as examples to share with you, to illustrate and elaborate my points. I'd like to say thank you to UMT for inviting me. It's such an honor to be able to join you uh, this afternoon. I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Shariza Mohamed Sharif uh, for inviting me for this session. I'm grateful uh, for your invitation. And also to Kwan Hadila, who has been uh, liaising with me uh, since uh, I think about two, I think about three weeks ago since she sent out the invitation. What will happen for today's session? As uh, it is a two-hour session, it's quite a long session. I decided that I'm going to break our session into part one and part two. Part one would be about just let me pull out my uh, list picture, yeah. So part one will be getting to know rubrics. It is a session where it will be, I think it will go under one hour, where I will expose you to the rudimentary knowledge of rubrics, meaning that I would like to share with you some basic knowledge about rubrics. Before we go into part two, part two is about how do you develop and design your own rubrics. Let me share with you my experience in using rubrics. I started using rubrics ever since I started my career as an academician at UPM. But at that point of time, I only knew it was a rubric. I didn't really know that there were many types of rubric, the components of rubric, but I was adapting. I was uh, looking for rubrics which were available online. Actually, there are many which you can use. And after using it for quite a number of years, then I had this passion in is rubrics and I started to learn more about rubrics and all this while I have been adapting rubrics I have designed rubrics and that's where my experience have built up to what I have to share with you today for today's session we have two learning outcomes very simple the first one is to differentiate the various types of rubrics there are many rubrics actually but I will be sharing with you the two most common types of rubrics and then the second rubric, rubric would be to evaluate the suitability of rubrics for the intended assessment, which means that when we design our learning assessment for our students, it should come with a rubric that's aligned to what our assessment is all about. And that's very important, the alignment part. And I think when we talk about alignment, we always relate that to the OBE, outcome-based education. Everything has to be aligned where we have this our instruction, then we have our learning activities, then we have our assessments, and how it goes back, it's aligned to the learning outcome. For this part one, we will have three components that I'm going to share with you. First is getting to know rubrics. Why do we actually use rubrics, the benefits of rubrics, the purpose of using rubrics? Then I will introduce you to the two types of rubrics, the analytic rubric as well as the holistic rubric. These are the two most common rubrics that we have, which is usually used by instructors. And then I will zoom in to the component of rubric. I have a few slides here explaining to you the anatomy of rubrics, which are criteria performance indicators, and the rating scales. These are the key words of rubrics. And later, I will tell you, I will share with you, explain to you what you mean by criteria, what you mean by performance indicators. Performance indicators, there's another term. You may have come across it. You may have heard of performance descriptors. They mean the same thing. And the rating scales of a rubrics. Basically, these are the things that I will be covering for part one. And we will have probably just five minutes break since it's a two-hour um, webinar. 
And then we'll come back for part two, which is about crafting and designing your own rubrics. So what's the purpose of using rubric? Uh, before we use something, we need to know what's the purpose of the rubrics. Well, there are many purposes of using a rubric. Of course, we know that rubrics is about assessing students' performance. And when we talk about students' performance, it is about what the things students are able to do, what the things are, the students are able to, to make, what they're able to say, what they're able to write. It aligns with the learning outcome. This is very important, like I mentioned. Your LO has to align with your learning assessment. When we talk about performance, yeah, we have two types of performance, which I will talk a little bit later on, which is process and product. That's the whole idea of when you're talking about measuring students' performance. Now, before we go into looking at uh, students' performance, there are a couple of benefits. I'm sure that quite a number of us have been using rubrics. And because that you know that it's beneficial to you, you have been continuing to use rubrics and even design your own rubrics. What I have here are six benefits. There are many other benefits, but I just like to focus on these six. We use rubric not only for ourselves as instructors, but it also benefits our learners. And I believe that you would agree with me that it works for both of the learners as well as the instructors. Let's look at the first benefit. Using the rubric would support the authentic assessment. Now, what do you mean by authentic? Does it mean that it works for authentic but not for non-authentic kind of learning environment? Actually, it comprises both. It works for both kinds of assessment. Let me explain to you. When you say support authentic assessment, it reflects how well your learners are able to apply the knowledge in the real world context. For example, in my field education, I train teachers, future teachers, which means that my students will go to schools. They will be school teachers in primary schools or secondary schools. In the real world context here would mean that my students will be assessed in schools. For our students, they go out for latihan mengajar or practical training where they are training teachers for 12 weeks. That's what we mean by authentic learning environment. And how do I assess these teachers? I assess them by looking at how they actually handle a class with real students in the classroom and how they actually manage the class in terms of discipline, how they are teaching the content. I'm looking at the pedagogy. That is what we mean by apply knowledge in the real world context. So supporting authentic assessment. Non-authentic would be, they would be in the classroom, you are also assessing the students, you give them assessments which could be completed in the classroom or out of the classroom, that's also supporting assessment. Number two would be to communicate expectations. What do you mean by communicate expectations? When we give our students some kind of assignments, right, we usually would explain to our students. It gives learners the idea and what is expected to do. It is especially useful when the rubric are communicated to the learners before they are assessed. I'm sure when you receive your assignment, let's say we, we, are, we assume ourselves as students and you receive this assignment, right? And you'll be, you'll be looking through, you'll be asking, what is it that this lecturer wants me to do? What is it that I'm supposed to do? How can I get good grades for this assessment? for this assignment. This is what we mean by communicating expectations. What I have found is that when I give this assignment to my students, it is helpful when I give the rubrics together with my students, with, together with the, assess, the assignment at the beginning of the semester. 
that helps them to understand what is it that I want from them? What is it that they are supposed to be able to achieve or do for this assignment? This is what we mean by communicate expectations. Previously, I did not give my rubrics. The rubrics was actually meant for my marking. But what I noticed is that when I did not share the rubrics with my students, I find that the students ask me a lot of questions. They will come to me, they will wait after the class, they will ask me what is it that I'm expecting from them. So then I realized that probably it'd be good if I can give it to them at the start of the semester together with the assignments that I give. All my assignments are given at the very beginning of week one or week two of the semester. This gives them a clear idea of what they need to do, how much is expected from them, and so that they don't do last minute work, knowing students. If you give them maybe at week seven, they will start at week 10 for the assignment. Giving them at week one of the semester, they don't have any more excuse to say, oh, I don't have time to complete the assignment. So that's my whole idea why I give my assignments as well as the rubrics at the very beginning of my semester. Yeah? So uh, the third one would be to improve performance. Explicit criteria and performance level descriptions. These are the keywords just now I mentioned. You have the criteria and you have the performance descriptors. The other term that I mentioned was performance indicators. I'm going to show you very um, in detail how do you actually write them? How do you actually create such criteria? How do you decide what should be included in your rubrics? And when these are given to your students, it allows the learners to understand the desired performance, which means that rubrics is a very detailed document. You have to be explicit in what you want your students to be able to do. And the learners are able to assess themselves. How do they assess themselves? Oh, I can do this. If my rubric says you need to include three videos, then they will go and look for three videos to insert in the assignment. And they will know that roughly I'm going to get quite high marks because the rubrics has stated as such. And this self-assessment is very important for students to be able to reflect on what can they do and what they cannot do. And if they know that they cannot do this particular kind of task, then they will have to work harder. So this is what we mean by improved performance. Number four would be provide informative feedback. I think this is very important where the instructor is able to provide constructive feedback to learners on their weaknesses and strength. It's very objective when you have a rubrics. When students ask you where is their weakness, you just point out at where they are not scoring well. That's what we mean by provide informative feedback. Benefit number five would be promote thinking and learning. Students will have to think. And when they start thinking, that's where learning takes place. And learners are able to review and revise their work, thus reflecting their learning experience. Learning experience is a very important process of their journey as a student. And lastly, ensure fairness. I think this is also very important. We do not want students to feel that they are being shortchanged in the sense that they are fairly given or fairly assessed. And it's very objective because if you score four, why did you score four? This is what you have in your assignment according to the rubrics. If you have more, then you score maximum marks. It helps avoid dispute between learners and instructors about the scores grades achieved. This is something that I've noticed when I use rubrics. Students who come and ask me or challenge me because of low scores, the numbers of students reduce. Hardly any actually, but because they have this rubric, they know where is where, what, what, which part are they lacking. So basically, these are the six benefits that I have uh, prepared or I, I have experienced here in, in the sense that as an instructor, this is what I have encountered over the years of using this.
Now, there are two categories of rubrics. One is called a generic rubric. From the term generic, you'll be able to guess that it's a general rubric. And the other one is a task-specific rubric. You'll be able to guess as well that this is a very specific rubric. I'm going to show you examples of what you mean by generic rubrics and examples of task-specific rubrics. But just for your information, generic rubrics are used when you have several assignments. Let's say, for example, you have three assignments and you want to use the same rubric for all three assignments. That's what we mean by generic rubrics. But when you have a task-specific rubrics, you have three assignments. Each and every of your assignment has a specific rubric aligned to your assignment. This is what we mean by task-specific rubrics. I will share with you also, under what circumstances would you be using a generic rubric and under what circumstances would you be using a task-specific rubrics? This is the category, right? So I have uh, explained to you the purpose of using rubrics, the six benefits of using rubrics, the two categories of rubrics. Next would be what's a rubric? What's the definition of rubric? I'm quite sure that many of you are familiar with rubrics and you know what is a rubric. You've seen and you've used it. It is a set a tool yeah, comprising a set of criteria, the keyword again, with possible levels of performance quality on the criteria. Performance quality refers to the performance indicator or performance descriptor. That's the keyword of the rubric as well. Developed to assess any kind of student work from written to oral to visual by Brookhart 2013. Susan Brookhart, she is the guru of rubrics. I will show you the title of her book at the end of my presentation. And I highly recommend you to read her book. It's very easy going and it's a very thin book. It's not a thick book, which makes reading very easy. This is the definition of rubrics. It is meant for assessment. And I think by using rubrics, it makes assessment or assessing our students much easier for us. And it guides our students in giving their best for each and every of the assignments. Earlier, I mentioned that when we talk about rubrics, when we talk about assessment, it's about measuring students' performance. I also mentioned that there are two types of performance. The first is process, and the second one is product. What do you mean by Process. This is taken from Brookhart's uh, book. Yeah? The type of performance, when we, we are looking at it from the perspective of processes, it could mean physical skills, the use of equipment, oral communication, work habits, and for example, the student is able to play a musical instrument. The student is able to do a forward role. The student is able to prepare a slide for the microscope. But if you say that you are going to measure performance in terms of products, then it will be something very tangible. Bahan maujud, yeah? something that you can hold, something that you can see, which is, for example, this is very uh, basic, a wooden bookshelf, a set of welts, handmade aprons, watercolor paintings, assignments. These are examples of products, something which is tangible. You are going to decide when you want to use your rubric, what is it that you want to measure? Are you going to measure students' performance in terms of their processes or you want to assess the ability to produce a product? That's something that we as instructors will have to decide at the very beginning of when we are designing our assignment or assessment. Types of rubrics. Earlier on, I mentioned categories of rubric. We have generic and we have um, task-specific rubrics. Now I'm introducing to you another term. This is referring to the types of rubrics. Analytic rubric and holistic rubric. These are the two most common rubrics 
that most educators would use. And personally, I use a lot of analytic rubric. Very seldom I would use holistic rubric, but that depends on what is the purpose of you designing your assignment. Why are you assigning, uh, designing this particular assignment? Perhaps if you want to use a holistic rubric, which you think is more suitable, then by all means, proceed. I will show you the difference between analytic rubric and a holistic rubric. And each of the criteria is scored individually. Students will be able to see their scores. They will know their scores, even if you're using analytic or holistic rubric. Now, um, before I move on to the next, the next slide, I think I probably would like to, uh, to know if you have any questions or if you have anything to share with me. Um, I'm okay if you like to unmute and speak up. Is that okay, Dr. Fatima? Yes, of course. Mm. Right, thank you. So we'll just kind of like have a more interactive session so that uh, I, I'm also hoping to hear from um, lecturers in UMT what are your preferences? Because the areas that you all are all trained in are different, I presume, as um, my discipline, my discipline is education. So I believe your area probably, let's say, for your program, you have a lot of uh, psychomotor kind of skills that you want to mention. Perhaps, yeah? As compared to education, we don't have that many psychomotor kinds of skills that we want to mention. So it's more of cognitive <clears throat> or effective. This is the anatomy of an analytic rubric. I mentioned earlier that we have two types of rubric, analytic and holistic. Let's look at how an analytic rubric look like. So anatomy, of course, means that the components of, an, of this analytic rubric, it, may, it is made up of criteria on the left-hand side. It is also made up of the rating scales, low, moderate, high, and these cells here would reflect the desired performance descriptors or performance indicators. So there are three main components of a rubric for an analytic rubric. When we say criteria, so criterion one, two, and three is what is the criteria of the desired performance? What is it, for example? I will show to you, but who is going to decide what is the criteria? Who is going to decide what are the rating scales? And who is going to decide the desired performance? It is us, the instructors, the educators. We are the expert and we are going to design and decide. Criterion one, what is it that we want from this assignment? The row represents the criteria for the desired performance while the column represents the evaluation score. So this is what we mean by evaluation score. Yeah? Low, moderate, high. This is just three rating scales. I can have four. Very high. I probably want to have five. That depends on you, how you want to design your rubrics. But very rarely, you would have one or, or two. Usually, we have a minimum of three for your rating scales. Now, you will notice that my rating scales is in the form of a range, yeah? 0 to 5%, 6 to 10%, 11 to 15%. It's always an interval. But there are also circumstances where you don't prefer to have a range. Yeah? You would prefer like low, one score or one mark. Moderate, two, high, maybe three. That is also possible if you prefer it to be that way. Yeah? But for me, after using both kinds of rating scales, I prefer to have a range because when you say about higher, sometimes we know that every student is into this, they're very unique, but they are very excellent. But of course, they're, they can't be excellent at like exactly, you know, the same. They have the same set of skills, but there's a range in that. That is why I prefer to have a range when I design my group with 11 to 15. They are still considered as very excellent students. They have high performance of um, high skills or good skills. Criterion, this is an example where I have three. You can have four, five, depending. The more criteria you have, then the more specific your rubric is going to be. And then when you have designed that to be in this 
more than three criterion, for example, then you will have to design and think of what would be your performance descriptor. I'll show you in a while what do you mean by performance descriptor, yeah, examples of criteria and so forth. This is analytic rubric. Here's an example of an actual assignment that we designed for our students. I teach subjects like technology pendidikan. I teach subjects like instructional design. My area of expertise is uh, ICT in education. So it's very technology related, but focusing on the area of education. Let's look at this assignment. Yeah? Weightage 10%. Students will have to hand out the assignment in week 14, which is at the end of the semester. What is it that I want my students to be able to do? To create an e-portfolio. Now, this e-portfolio is an individual assignment throughout the semester. Students may use, so they may use any platform to sign up for an e-portfolio account, for example, Blogspot, Wix site, WordPress, and so forth. In the portfolio, you must post updates and progress of your project. They have a big project and write reflections based on the activities done throughout the semester. You must update your e-portfolio at least once a week and may update it as often as you wish. What they were supposed to do is they were required to come up or to develop a board game, a board game for their teaching in class. The entire board game would take 14 weeks yeah, of their time. And while they were doing this assignment, the board game, I asked them to capture their reflection in this block. And that carried 10%. The board game itself carried 30%, which I'm not sharing here. But I just use this block as one example of an assignment that I gave to my student. Mode of submission. The students were required to upload the URL of their blog by week two so that I could actually go in every blog to see if they had written any reflection. This was one of the assignments that I gave for my students. Now, looking at this assignment, I want to share with you the corresponding rubric. This is how the rubric that we designed. We actually adapted this rubric. We, we didn't create it from scratch because if you Google, there's lots of rubrics available and the instructors yeah, or the people who created this rubric are willing to share their rubrics with anyone assessing it online. Yeah? This is an example of what we call a task-specific rubric. Remember, remember I said there are generic rubric and a task-specific rubric. This is an example. Task specific means that it is so specific only for this assignment that I asked my student to create a block. Let's have a look here. Now, remember on the left hand side, I said that we have the criterion. So these are examples of the criterion that we decided that we want to measure for this block assignment the student's ability to communicate of to com uh, their communication of reflection how can they put across or they express their ideas when they are writing this reflection that's one criterion next one would be content knowledge the next one is effort this is just one part of the rubrics actually have, I think, about uh, six criterions. Yeah? I've just cut and paste uh, three criterions for you here. On the top here is the rating skill. Adequate, developing, competent, excellent. And you will note that we didn't have a range. So if you're adequate, you'll get one mark. Developing two, competent three, excellent four. And what you see inside here, are the performance indicator or the performance descriptor. What you will notice as we move along to the right hand side, the descriptors become longer and longer, which means that the expectations go higher. The more expectations, 
of what the students need to do. Then they will get four marks to be, uh, to be categorized as excellent. For example, communication of reflection. If the student is only merely reporting, they just lapo, eh, melapo. Hari ini saya dapat menghasilkan something. They're just telling me. Eh? I don't find that to be a reflection. Then probably very low marks would be one. But if the student, apart from just reporting, they are reflecting what they are learning, how do they feel, then that would probably give them four for the scores. It reflects originality, it is comprehensive. The learner is able to generate new ideas from the learning activity. They show me pictures, they show me diagrams, they include videos. That would be something I would say excellent. As compared to just melapo or just reporting. This means that when you create your rubric, there must be progression of the performance indicators. Let's take another example. Effort, right? How much effort did the students actually put in for my assignment? I can see that this particular student didn't update the blog. If he had done it for 14 weeks, at least a minimum of 14 updates. Just one sentence, then probably I will give only one mark. But if the portfolio shows updates, several updates, yeah, many updates, which indicate that there's more, more than 14 updates and elaborate, I'm sorry that there's this uh, overlapping, yeah? it elaborately reflects the learning activity. Then student will get high marks. This is how a rubric should look like. It gives you the ability to differentiate, yeah? If you want to give students excellent or you want to give students competent, three marks, yeah? But the question now is that, going back to what you want your students to be able to achieve for this assignment. That's something that we as the educator have to decide. And of course, writing these descriptors, yeah? It, it takes a lot of time to write these descriptors. You have to really brainstorm, especially if you are co-teaching. It'd be good to co-teach a, a subject and then you brainstorm with your colleague how you want to write the performance descriptors. But I, but like I mentioned, you know, when you actually want to create your rubrics, before you do that, Google first. You may find some very interesting rubrics that you're able to adopt and even adapt for your course. That, that's something that I usually do. Another example, this rubric is quite comprehensive, lesson plan development. For all of us as educators, I'm sure you know what is a lesson plan. We need to prepare a lesson plan before the semester starts. But this is very detailed. And it has four rating scales. Beginning, developing, accomplish, exemplary. And you will notice that there is a range, 16 to 20. That's for exemplary. Accomplish, 11 to 15. Developing, 6 to 10. Beginning, 0 to 5. And you will see that on the left-hand side, the criteria, there's weightage attached to each criteria, meaning not all criteria are equal. For example, this lesson plan, yeah, 15% goes to the instructional goals and objective. The bulk of this assignment, which is 40%, is the instructional strategies. I like this kind of rubrics because you need to ensure that when you design your assignments, yeah, there must be certain parts which are the most important part of your assignment. There could be some parts which are not so important, but it has to be included in the assignment. That is why attaching it with the weightage could be useful to you. And I do it all the time. If you don't put in the weightage, it means that 
all the criteria carries the same weightage, which to me, in my field, I don't think that would be fair because when you talk about lesson plan, it's about, it's about the student's ability to teach their pedagogy, right? And when you talk about pedagogy, what kind of instructional, instructional strategies would the students be using? So that's why this one carries 40%, which is the instructional strategies. This is, a, this is an example of a rubric that I found on the internet. I didn't make any changes because it was something that is so relatable to my area, education, and it's retrieved from the internet. Yeah? Uh, when usually these people, when they are so kind to share their rubrics online, they, there is no restriction in uh, using their rubrics, not for commercial purposes. Earlier, I mentioned about analytic rubric. Now let's look at holistic rubric. There are two types of rubrics, just to recall. We have an analytic and holistic. This is how a holistic rubric it's simple, much simpler than an analytic rubric. You will see that on the left-hand side are the scores. Low, moderate, high. This is the rating skills. And what you have on the right-hand side here would be the performance indicators. Is the combined desired performance descriptors are written here. Meaning it, com it comprises the rating scale, corresponding weights or scores, can be assigned in the row while the combined desired performance descriptors are placed in the column. This is an example of a holistic rubric. I hardly use a holistic rubric to be honest, yeah, uh, because I don't find it to be specific enough. But there are certain certain um, situations, certain situations where holistic rubric would be appropriate. Now. Going back to the assignments that I mentioned earlier about the blocks, yeah. what if I decided, instead of using an analytic rubric, I decided, okay, I'm going to use a holistic rubric. How does it look like? How is it going to look like if I change my analytic rubric to a holistic rubric? It can be done. This is how it would look like. What you notice here, on the left-hand side, adequate, less than 49% if it's an excellent assignment scoring above 85%. And you see that all the performance descriptors have been lumped into one cell. Let me give you an example. Yeah? Learner is merely reporting and summarization or summary or summarize of events or learning activities, learners show limited ability to connect the theories of diffusion of innovation to the learning activities. The portfolio has less than 14 updates. This is how a holistic rubric. Just to recap, if I had actually used the analytic rubric, what did I do actually? How did I transform my analytic rubric into a holistic rubric? What I did was I put all these performance indicators, which are labeled as adequate, I put them together. Same thing as well. If I change this into a holistic rubric, developing yeah, all these three would be lumped together. All right. So you have my slides. You can probably look at it again yeah, to see that actually it's just rearranging your analytic rubric into your holistic rubric and vice versa. That is an example of a very specific or task-specific rubric. Now, let me give you an example of what do you mean by a generic rubrics for multiple assignments? Just as I mentioned that when you use generic, generic rubrics, it's usually for the case where you have multiple assignments and all these assignments would be using the same rubric. For this semester, I am teaching instructional design for my post-grad. I gave them three assignments. 
I told my students, choose two out of three assignments. I wanted to give them freedom. I didn't want to fix all three. You need to do all three. Give them the opportunity. You choose two out of these three assignments which you think you will be able to do well. You have better understanding. And because if I have given this freedom to my students, there will be a combination of some students will choose assignment one and two. Possible also students would choose assignment two and three. There is also another possibility that my students would choose assignment one and three. These are the three combinations, right? Because I have three assignments. But this assignment carries 20 marks, 20%. When I give this kind of assignments, of course, my rubric has to be standardized. It has to be standardized because of each assignment carries 20%. And to be fair, right? So I do not want my students to choose assignment three because that rubric seems to show that it's easier to gain marks yeah, for assignment three. That is why a generic rubric is more appropriate, is more useful yeah, under these circumstances. So this is the first uh, time that I decided that I wanted to give choices to my students. Previously, I fixed, yeah, okay, you do assignment one and two, Mandatory, compulsory. But if you give choices to your students, I think that would be a situation where I find that students are happier in that sense. They have less stress because they can choose. And they will start looking yeah, at their notes and see which one of these three assignments, which two of these three assignments that they will be able to score better. So I just very quickly to go through with you. This is instructional design. I'm, this is my area. So I just want to show with you. I show you, yeah. How does a generic rubric look like? This is how a generic rubric looks like. All assignments, regardless assignment one, two, or three, would be assessed using the same rubric. Now, if you look at the left hand side, these are my criteria. I have three criteria on the screen here relevancy of main concept. You see the word that I use, main concept? I didn't use very specific because each and every of the three assignments has a main concept, depending on which assignment that they choose. If they are able to understand the main concept, yeah, so the understanding of the main concept is lacking or substantially inadequate, it will score between one and one, two, three, four. But if they have very good understanding, It exceeds expectations. They know more than what I have shared with them. They showed me that they are reading extra references. Then it would fall between 15 and 20 percent or 20 points. Maximum 20 points. Converted points, you see on the right hand side, understanding the main concept carries 35% of my assignment. I wanted to help them by just having this criteria, in-text citation. You just have any citation which is related to instructional design, you get 10 marks. That's a bonus actually. I just purposely put that so just to help the students. But it has quite a small weightage, 10%. This is an example of how a generic rubric looks like. So, I think that captures the first part of our webinar today, right? So, it's uh, 3.25, almost reaching 3.25. Is it okay? We take a five-minute uh, break. But at the same time, if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to hear from you. If you have anything to share with me, please do unmute and share. Hello, Prof Wong. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria. Um, I have I have two questions. Uh, from your examples of rubrics just now, that means uh, we can measure both process and product in one rubric, right? 
Yes, you may. You have two components of your rubric. You okay. can have a mixture, no problem. Some people decide that it's important to have both. Okay. Uh, my second question is, um, uh, we we used to have this weightage for uh, uh, one particular criteria. For example, um, the criteria number one, we put some weightage there. Uh, uh, we give 15 marks. Uh, sorry, we have the four four scales, but then we times four. For example, for that one particular criteria to indicate that students need to give more effort on that particular criteria. Is that okay? That is also acceptable. I think that's really a wonderful idea. You, you, you have a multiplication of times three or times four. I didn't think of that, but um, that is really good because it shows that there's more effort needed for that particular criteria. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Welcome. Any more questions or any more sharing? So I, I, I'm so grateful that you you raised that. Yeah. Uh, instead of putting the weightage, you times four there, meaning that for other criteria is four marks, but for this particular criteria is sixteen marks. Anyone else like to? Okay, Prof. Uh, we have one question from uh, Dr. Rosliza. Any yes. hint on when to choose analytic or holistic rubric? All right. That is going to be covered in part two of our session. There will be some guiding questions here that I will share with you which will help you decide, should I be using an analytic rubric or should I be using a holistic rubric? Really good question. Thank you for that. Hello? Uh, prof. Uh, sorry, okay. Silakan. <laughs> Hello, it's still cute. Tak apa, Dr. Maria? Tak apa, ya? Hello, Dr. Prof. I'm Farida. Hi. Uh, I just want to ask you, if let's say if we have a rubric and we also uh, fix with the scale, let's say one to four, uh, and then uh, each of the scale have their own uh, sub-attribute, right? Uh, right. Then is it okay if uh, the penilai choose uh, in between the scale? They say one to two, they, they choose a one point five like that. Is that okay? Ah, okay. Hmm. Um, I have sometimes yeah decided that once this rubric is one two three four five, um, it doesn't give me a, a range yeah. I have actually graded one point five. That is also possible. But when you grade 1.5, you as, as the, the educator or the instructor needs to know 1.5 means you are, you are actually saying that they are between 1 and 2. That is acceptable, but I would prefer if you have the opportunity to design your own rubric, yeah, put a, a range, then you will probably won't have uh, this kind of uh, intention of giving 1.5, uh, 2.5 like that. Thank you, Prof. Welcome. Pro, Pro Wong, I have uh, yes. one more yes. question. Just uh, yes. just asking for your comment. Yeah. Um, I am actually involved with the Jawatan Kuasa OBE JPT. Right. And then when we had our um, uh, briefing on MQF 2.0 last time, we had this question from the, the participants. Um, is the AJK going to come out with uh, a new uh, buku rubric like buku ICG, buku rubric ICGPA? Yeah. So our answer was no at the moment. Uh, we we have no intention of um, coming out with another buku rubric lah. So uh, this indicates that um, some some um, lecturers or some academicians. Uh, still did not get this idea or this uh, uh, concept that they are the one who need to identify what what they should measure actually. So they they rely heavily on the buku panduan rubric and look at the criteria and then say, ah, okay, this is doable, this is measurable for my my course. So um, although buku rubric is a, a good a good guide. But then sometimes um, some some of the lecturers rely heavily on that, and 
forgot that they are the ones who 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 are supposed to to decide what they want to measure actually your your comments on that prof dr mariam if i was sitting beside you during the q and a session i would have given the same answer as you as well um, <laughs> you cannot rely for one specific rubric for your course from someone else because you are the expert we wouldn't know what is your content which means that when you create a rubric it is something that you are going to measure and it depends on your learning outcome so if we are going to give one rubric it is it's going to defeat the whole idea of creating a rubric already the rubric is developed by the instructor who has knowledge in the discipline that that the person is teaching and it depends on the learning outcome that the instructor has decided for that particular course what you all can prepare is just a very general uh, guideline yeah? what's the rubric and all that but like you said probably this uh, person who asked this question didn't have enough understanding that rubric is very specific to your own course and we are responsible for our own rubrics actually because our assignments changes every semester for example before the pkp right before we went into pandemic my assignment was different i sent my students to school to interview teachers and suddenly we had this lockdown i had to change my entire assessment no more i can't send my students out anymore i had to redesign my assessment so it is very subjective in a sense that who is teaching that course and how you want to assess your students so it goes back to our instructor so I think that that's a very good uh, point to, to share, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. All right, so it's 3.30. We have a five minutes break. So now I'm going to go into the second part of our session today. So for those who can join us late, um, I earlier I had shared with you the slides here yeah, where you can access my slide. You can just scan this QR code. My slide is in PDF. It's all there. Part two is about crafting your rubrics in five easy steps. After many years of using rubrics and many rubrics that I have used, adapted uh, by using someone else's rubrics, I kind of like feel that it's so easy to come up with your own rubrics. And I came up with these five easy steps to guide you on crafting your own rubrics or designing your own rubrics. Yeah? So in case that you feel that sometimes whatever that's available for rubrics may not be suitable for your course or you want something which is very tailor-made to your course, yeah, then it's time for you to start thinking on how do you design your own rubrics. This is the ultimate goal of the second part of this webinar yeah, is to equip you with fundamental knowledge to design and develop your own analytic rubrics. I'm zooming in into analytic rubrics already, right? So just now we had a question, how do you decide whether you're going to use analytic or holistic? That would be answered in step two, if I'm not mistaken, of my, um, my slides here. Yeah? Let's look at the learning outcome. There's only one learning outcome which is to design and develop your own analytic rubrics. But you already have an idea of what is a holistic rubric. Yeah? By applying the same steps, the five easy steps here, I'm sure you will be able to develop your own holistic rubrics as well, if you feel that it's more suitable for your course. This is what I'm going to share with you, the contents here. Yeah? Step one, define the purpose of the learning task. What is the purpose of your assignment? What's the whole idea of giving this assignment to your students here? Yeah? Step two, choose a rubric type. And this is where we will answer the question. Is an analytic rubric or a holistic rubric suitable for my course? Once you have decided that, okay, for this particular assignment, I am going to be using an analytic rubric, I'm going to define the criteria, which is step three. Step four would be design the rating scale. And lastly, to write performance descriptors. I must say that the hardest part here yeah, of creating your own rubric would be step five, because that's where you have to write the performance descriptors. 
what do you want your students to be able to do what should your students include in the assignment yeah, in order for him or her to score the highest mark this is where it is quite challenging in a sense but if you have a group of lecturers teaching the same course it would, it would be very useful to brainstorm and once you brainstorm you will have a lot of ideas yeah so that's the five steps that i'm going to share with you and that's also that also makes up the the cost of them so what are the five steps here yeah? i already actually explained to you this now in the previous slide if you put it in, in a diagram this is how it should start where you start you define the purpose of your learning task. First of all, you have to ask yourself, for this course, how many credits, right? What is the learning outcome? How many assignments is needed to answer or how many assessment is needed to answer or to achieve the number of learning outcome that you have decided or you have planned for? Then you choose your rubric. You define your criteria. All right, so these are keywords again, once again, criteria, rating scale, and performance descriptors. By the end of this webinar, these three key terms here should be familiar to you, and you know what exactly that you need to do when you design our own rubrics. For every of these steps, there are guiding questions that will help you. I'm just sharing a few questions here. Yeah? You may have more questions than what I have actually, but let's look at the first one. Yeah? Define the purpose of your learning task. What is the purpose of having this activity? Yeah? Uh, is it going to be graded? Will I use the rubric to assign learners grades? For some activities, we don't grade them. Some activities, they have rubrics, but they, have no, they don't have scores. Possible also, yeah, which means that they are competent. You categorize them as beginners, but no scores. You just want to let them know after week two or week three, where are they? How much do they know about this course? Will I use the rubric to provide informative feedback to learners? Are you using this rubric for yourself as well as for your learners? Definitely, yeah, when you design your rubric, it has to have some performance descriptors. And these performance descriptors would be useful to your learners. So that's what we mean by informative feedback. Yeah? What are the learning outcomes of the task? What do you want the students to achieve after completing this assessment or this learning assignment? How will learners demonstrate that they have achieved the learning outcomes? Are they going to show you? A product? Are they going to be doing some kind of activity in the class that will be some process then? Or it could be a combination of both. With these questions answered, that would be defining the purpose of your learning task. This is an example of an assignment. Yeah? The course is Diffusion of Innovation. It's taught by my colleague, Dr. Masnidia. And before she developed the assignment, this is the description of the task that she had in mind. It's concretized. Yeah? Whatever that you have in mind is your idea. But you concretize it means that you state it in a very explicit form. Yeah? What is this task is about? Let me just read to you. Yeah? The purpose of this assignment is to assess learners' cognitive and analytic skills in applying knowledge gained and constructed through the course Diffusion of Innovation. It's a master's course by watching the surrogates movie. Students have to watch this particular movie on YouTube. They have to relate to this Diffusion of Innovation and they need to write an analytical review of the movie in the context of innovation diffusion. I want to provide learners with informative feedback on the cognitive and analytic skills such as the following. Applying the concept of innovation diffusion, 
making judgments on the census related to innovation diffusion, selecting and critiquing theories of innovation diffusion, and making connections between the theories as well as arguing and proposing unnecessary solutions. The one in red shows very clearly that these are going to be the criteria for the groupings. When you design your learning assessment, yeah, it's very useful if you have this very explicit purpose of your assignments. Then it will help you to go to the next level in creating your rubrics. This is the first step. That's knowing the purpose of your assignment. So which means that you're completizing your ideas. You are very clear in your mind that this is what I want my students to do. This is the purpose of the assignment. Step number two would be, should I be using an analytic rubric or should I be using a holistic rubric? Here are some questions to guide you. If you feel that all your answer is yes, to this first part, yeah? then analytic rubric would be the one that you're looking for. Do I want to provide a detailed feedback for the learning task? Do I want to provide informative feedback for each component of the learning task? If your answer is yes for the first one, yes for the second one. Do I want to provide formative feedback about learners' performance on individual elements of a learning task? If you say yes, then analytic rubric would be your choice. But how about holistic rubric? Do I want to assess the learning task as a whole? Do I want to make a general judgment? I don't go detail, I just general judgment. Do I want to assess the learner's overall performance for the learning task? Do I want to provide summative feedback about the overall learning performance on the learning task? then I would say go for a holistic rubric. It's a little bit more generic or more general than an analytic rubric. So holistic rubric, yeah? if you answer all yes to this second part of the questions, you would be able to decide that holistic rubric is more appropriate for what you have planned for your course. I wouldn't say that having a, an analytic rubric is better than holistic rubric or holistic rubric is less uh, in terms of its uh, proficiency in assessing your students. Yeah? It really depends on what is your purpose. What do you want from this assignment yeah, uh, for your students? Which means that it goes back to the instructors and the educators. We decide, we have to make judgment here, and then we decide what's best for our students. So nobody can actually design our rubrics. Yeah? Uh, you shouldn't allow anyone to, to design uh, rubrics and then just say, okay, use it. Wrong, you use this rubric. I wouldn't allow that because you are not teaching my course. I'm teaching this course. Unless you are a co-teacher or you are collaborating with me, then we can use the same rubric. If you are not part of the teaching, uh, the instructor of this course here, um, no way I'm going to use your rubrics because you don't know what, what I want for this course, what I have been teaching for this course. Only the person who teaches this course will know best for the students. Going back to the anatomy of the analytic rubric. Just, just to recap, I showed you the same diagram uh, in part one of our session. Criteria of desired performance. Desired performance descriptors here, which are written in this cell, and the rating scales with corresponding weights. You can decide how many percent you want here, yeah? There's no wrong or right answer. It could be zero to 50, for example. I've seen, yeah? Um, your rating scales also doesn't mean it has to end at 100%. I've seen rating scales which goes up to 200%. It really depends on how you want to assess a student. But at, at the end of the day, you have to convert it uh, into percentage for your students, right? So this is recapping the analytic rubric. Next, after you have decided that holistic rubric is appropriate for my course or analytic rubric is appropriate for my course, then you define the criteria. What criteria is important to be included in your rubrics? It depends on your learning outcome. 
It depends on your purpose of having this assignment or designing this assignment. Here are some guiding questions. What do I want my learners to learn from this learning task? Students are able to bake a cake. That's one something that you have to decide. If you want your students to be able to bake a cake, then your criteria that you set has got to be related to the process of baking a cake. In what ways will learners demonstrate what they have achieved in terms of the knowledge, psychomotor, or affective domains? You decide. Is this rubric going to have knowledge, psychomotor, as well as effective? Or only for this assignment, I'm just measuring students' knowledge. It really depends on you. And what are the attributes of the final product? What does the product, what are the characteristics of a product? So let's say I'm giving you an example of a cake, right? So what, what is the characteristics of a good, nice looking cake? Right? Colors, the textures, and all that. This is what we mean by defining the criteria. And defining the criteria means that you have to decide how many criteria would be enough to measure holistically your student's performance. Could be five. It could be 10. But if we have 20, there'll be too many. Yeah? So it depends on what is the scope of your learning activity or what is the scope of your assignments. I usually have less than 10 eh, for criteria because if the more you have, the longer you take for marking. And five to eight will be good. Anything below five, I think there's a little bit too, too little uh, for you to assess the, the assessment, unless you have many assignments. That's step three. Good criteria have the following characteristics. So what are the characteristics of a good criteria? Eh? Number one, observable and measurable. Something that you can observe, something which is measurable, something which is important and essential, something which is distinct from the other criteria. Criterion one, criterion two, yeah? they must be different. If it looks the same, it overlaps, then I would say this rubric is not so good. What you write in your performance descriptors yeah, should be phrased in precise, unambiguous language. It is only, remember, yeah, the rubric is not only for us, but it is also for our students. Words that we use, the terms that we use here, yeah, could be so high level that it is only understandable to us, but it gives your students, students will not be able to understand. That defeats the entire purpose of having the rubrics. Remember, rubrics is designed by an expert, which is the instructor, but it is also designed to help your students. It must be written in a very friendly language, something which the students can understand. Here is an example of the criteria based on the course expectations of diffusion of theory. Just now, I mentioned about that particular course, diffusion of innovation theory. The lecturer required the students to watch the movie Surrogates from YouTube. These are the five criteria that is important to be included in the rubric when you're talking about this course, the diffusion of innovation. Communication of theory knowledge, TK. Communication of content knowledge, CK. Communication of ideas and argument. Connections between CK and TK. And writing and formatting. That's that criteria. Let's look at how it looks like if we are going to put in a table form. Usually rubrics yeah, would have a table. That's, that's the most common um, characteristics of a rubric yeah, is in a table form. The scores are arranged either in an ascending or descending order. Yeah? So you can have one, two, three, four, or it could be the other way around. Yeah? Four, three, two, one. Depends on how you like it to be uh, included in your rubrics. I mentioned there are five criteria now. They are all inside these cells. These are the five criteria for this course. 
And these are the rating scale. One, two, three, four. A reminder, your scales must be continuous and they must be progression and they need to be equal. Meaning, you have below expectation, mid expectation, above expectation. That's progression. It is consistent. You can't have like below expectation, mid expectation and suddenly one competent here. It's not consistent in that sense. Yeah. So this is what it means by it has to be continuous, shows progression, and it's equal. Equal means that your scores. So 0 to 5, 6 to 10, like that. And step 5. So this is the last part of creating your own rubrics. Yeah? You write the performance descriptors for your scale levels. Like I said, this is the hardest part of creating your own rubrics yeah? because you need to think, how do you put it in words? Yeah? How do you concretize your ideas of what students should be able to do or are able to achieve through your assessment? Number one, observable, measurable, and specific. Specific means that you're very, very specific that this falls under computer. These descriptors falls under less competent. Number two, parallel language to describe performance. The wordings must be consistent. I mentioned earlier, yeah, the wordings that you use yeah, has to be consistent. And your performance descriptors vary in degree. Yeah? Variation in degree is described in amount, how much, degree, or intensity. It means there's progression. Yeah? Somebody who is not so competent, moderately competent, very competent, excellent. So there is some kind of variation in the degree. Yeah? So when you talk about the differences in the degree, it could be measured in terms of the amount. It could be in terms of the degree uh, and intensity. How, how specific do you want it to be? Yeah? So let me share it with you. When you have descriptors which are not in parallel language, which means that they are not consistent. They are poor rubrics, I would say. Yeah? So going back to that cake, yeah? if you like to bake cake, I'm sure many of us like to bake cake, right? So, or you, you create or you bake a pie. When you bake a pie, you're looking at the crust. The scale below expectations, mid expectations, above expectations. And so you realize this rubric doesn't have scores. There's no scores attached to it, yeah? And the criteria is the crust. When you talk about pie, one important characteristic of a good pie is the crust. If the crust is soggy, heavy, and pasty, crust is somewhat too soft, thick, and hard, crust is flaky and light with even consistency, you will realize that there is no consistency and there is no progression when we talk about the crust. This description is talking about flakiness, right? When the, the crust is flaky, then you will say this is really a good pie. We don't like pie which is really hard. Yeah, the crust is hard. So the mistake is that one descriptor describes flakiness, one describes softness, which is the second one, and the last one is about sogginess. Uh, this one, below expectation. So it's not consistent, yeah? There's no progression in the performance descriptors. This is an example of a poor performance descriptor. How do you improve this performance descriptors? This is an example here. Top and bottom crusts are not light and flaky. Top and bottom crusts are somewhat light and flaky. Top and bottom crusts are very light and flaky. 
you can see that it's very consistent. We are talking about flakiness, right? And if the flakiness, yeah, or the crust is light and flaky, that is above expectations. This is a really good quality pie, I would say. This is what we mean by parallel language. Your ability yeah, to concretize your ideas when you say that you want the students to be able to achieve this performance or to do this performance or to execute this performance. The words that you use is very important. Now, the degree to which the standards are met, yeah? So how much do you want the students to be able to do? So this is what we mean by degree. So there are three ways to indicate a variation in degree. Yeah? I think I missed out the word frequency just now. Yeah? So it should be amount, frequency, and intensity. Intensity. Frequency is how many times. Intensity is how intense that you want the students to, to, to be able to perform these uh, skills. Yeah? Amount, maybe three times out of five times. Or maybe in terms of um, you're able to to come up with something which is like, uh, I'm not sure, depends on what area you're in, yeah, uh, when you're talking about these standards. So, this is the rubric that is related to the one that I showed you about the surrogates, the, the movie surrogates, yeah? I want to share with you, I just want to show you this rubrics yeah has one empty cell here the designer of this rubric so dr masiga she decided that for connections between ck and pk yeah, it didn't have to have adequate the students the lowest level that she was going to measure was developing which means that your descriptors yeah all these cells here doesn't have to be Full. But of course, you can't have lompang lompang la, like hikoso, and then suddenly hikoso muso. You can have here or here. It depends on your preference. So, for communication of theory and knowledge, yeah, indicates a theory of innovation and explain it. That's adequate. Developing. Indicates more than one theory. Uh, this one is amount. So this is the degree yeah, that we are talking about. Indicates more than one theory of innovation. If you have more than one theory, you will get two marks. If the person is considered to be competent, then the student is able to indicate all the theories of innovation and make at least two connections between the theories. If the student is considered to be excellent, indicates all the theories of innovation precisely and make more than three precise and elaborative connections between the theories. This is an example of what we mean by amount. If we look at communication of content knowledge CK, yeah? Names some, name some examples, example situations from the movie that is relevant to the concepts of diffusion and of innovation. So the student is only able to name it, but not able to elaborate. Yeah? Then the student will be given one mark. But if the student shows excellence here, elicit several example situations from the movie that are relevant to the concepts of diffusion and innovation and connect to real life situations, then that would be four marks. What I find that is when I develop my own rubrics here, I think a lot. I think a lot and it gives me an idea of how do I make it very clearly, yeah? how do I differentiate students who are excellent, competent, developing, and adequate. It's very important that you are able to differentiate students at different categories. 
so that what you are giving yeah, for the scores is fair to the students. In order to be able to write good descriptors means that you need to have deep knowledge of the subject. You must be an expert in that field yeah, before you can come up with your rubrics. If you have very poor knowledge in the subject you are teaching, you will find that it's a struggle to come up with your own rubrics. But sometimes also you may be new. You're a new lecturer. Uh, it will be the first time teaching this syllabus. Yeah, It's okay to find that you need help. Uh, you need to adopt someone else's rubrics and so forth. But I truly believe yeah, after you have been teaching this course for like four to five years, the experience counts and you would know that how to come up with your rubrics. Another thing that I discovered is that getting feedback from my students is very important about my rubrics. Yeah? I ask students if they think or how they feel about the rubric. Some say that, uh, Prof, perhaps in future you can include some more criteria. That would be a good way to improve your rubric. This means that your rubric is a work in progress. It's always evolving. And one thing that uh, I discovered, yeah, when before the pandemic, we used to have face-to-face -face class with our students. The rubric that I prepared, well, I thought that it was comprehensive enough. And when we were in this lockdown, yeah, so PKP and all that, we all had to do online. We never had our opportunities to meet our students. Students also find it like uh, it's not easy to talk to us. Yeah? Well, even though we give our handphone numbers, you you find that students probably they're too shy to contact us yeah? on the mobile phone. Um, and all that. They keep we decided that during this PKP, yeah, so the last two years, yeah, the whole team sat down together. So for my course, the undergraduate course, Technology Pendidikan, yeah, it's a compulsory course for undergraduate it is taught by four lecturers, yeah? so we have many groups. We sat down together and we said that the rubric has to be more comprehensive. Why? It would be useful to the students because students have very little engagement with us already. But having a more comprehensive rubric yeah, would be helpful to the students because of the situation it's not easy to talk to us face to face. In class, they can just come up to us and, and ask us, or when we are in campus, we just come, knock on your door and, and ask you. But during these two years, yeah, because of these barriers that we had, the students also had these barriers, we decided that our rubric had to be more comprehensive. What I'm saying is that you need to look at the context, under what circumstances uh, the learning environment is. The more Comprehensive, your rubric is if there is lesser contact with you. But the problem is, there were questions also asked when I shared this idea to uh, the participants. Yeah? They felt that if we have a very specific rubric, yeah, the students would not be able to think out of the box. They follow exactly what we want from the rubrics, which means that you are killing creativity. That is a good point also, uh, in the sense that Students say, okay, I'm going to get four marks. This is what exactly I'm going to do. So there's pros and cons of using rubrics. I wouldn't say rubrics is, um, you know, is the best in the world or what, but we weigh the pros and cons. But to me, there is more benefit here yeah, than the cons in, 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 in terms of students using the rubric. Okay, so. We've come to the end of our session. This is the book that I told you about. It is by Brookhart, Susan Brookhart. How to Create and Use Rubrics, a very simple um, book. Easy reading, a very thin book as well. I believe that you will like reading this book if you're really into rubrics. Yeah? So I'm very passionate about rubrics and that's how I got involved uh, with uh, with KPT, we, we came up with a book um, on uh, alternative assessment. So Dr. Shariza Yopongara was one of the authors. That's how I got to know him. And we all, all academicians from various universities, and we came up with this alternative assessment uh, book. So please refer to Dr. Shariza about this alternative assessment. Yeah? When we talk about assessment, 
of course, there's rubrics coming in. Now, there's another very interesting um, question that I received from a participant when I did this rubric webinar last year. Since that, when I discovered that the, the use of rubrics, the students are able to perform better. So when you say perform better means that it translates into better grade, right? So the question that was posed to me is that if you have students performing better, then what happens to the normal curve? You will have many students getting A's, right? And for me, I truly believe in the use of rubrics. When students meet a certain, certain criteria, you get the grades, you get A. Once you have so many students scoring A's, that would affect your normal curve. So is that going to be a problem? Now, my answer is that when you think about OBE, outcome-based education, if students are able to achieve this outcome, they're going to get an A. So why are we penalizing them? And how? why should we actually manipulate the um, normal graph, the bell curve? I'm not sure about UMT. Maybe you can share with me. Yeah? So in UPM, we do not look at the normal curve, uh, the, the bell curve. My course, which is educational technology, is two, point, two plus one course. Two hours of lecture, three hours of lab work. 70% of the course is based on assignments. 30% final exam. So the 30% final exam is written, uh, written exam. Sometimes we have MCQ, essays, and so forth. But the 70% of that assignment is students coming out with AR, apps, assignment kind of um, learning activities because they're teachers, they're going to be their future teachers. We teach them how to use AR. How do you create learning activities with AR inserted or embedded into your learning activities? We teach them about gamification. And we find that almost 40% of our students here would get very good grades for that 70%. So by the time they go into the final exam, they probably would get A. In UPM, if your course, 50% yeah, scores more than A, you just justify. They are not going to ask you to turun maka, posto maka, or go and campur maka or whatever. No, yeah, we don't do that. So I understand certain universities have their own policies. Um, if you are in a situation where you have to abide by the rule, yeah, a bell curve, yeah, using rubric will not cause your um, the scores to be rescued. It is not so bad. It's, there is also still the bell curve. This is based on my uh, experience. Now. So I, I think uh, with that, I'm done with uh, today's session. These are the references here. You have my slides. Um, like I said, the, the recommended reading material will be book hard. I think this one is no more available, yeah, O'Reilly. It, it's a, actually it's an online tutorial for faculty. So recently I went back to check on these uh, references. I can't find that website anymore. This one is still available, Royal. Yeah? But there are many more actually references that you can Google and you can uh, use it to learn more. And I hope for today's session, I've shared with you some uh, fundamental ideas. What is a rubric? What are the types of rubric? You're able to define um, what is a rubric. You're able to identify which rubric is suitable for your course. And with that five steps, you're all set to create your own rubrics. So basically, I think that's all I'm saying. Uh, I'm going to hand back to Dr. Fatima, our, our moderator. Yeah. So let's hear from our uh, moderator. Back to you, Doctor. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof, for a most uh, interesting and very informative presentation. So, today, uh, I suppose we have learned the uh, purpose of using rubrics, okay, benefits of using the rubrics, okay, the types of performance, uh, the types of rubrics, okay, there are two. Okay, and then last uh, for the last session, uh, the, how to design and develop analytic rubrics. 
okay so um, now uh, I open for the Q&A session uh, is there any question from the uh, floor yes uh, prof uh, hi yes uh, oh, uh, uh, very interesting actually prof I mean like um, all this time we just use the existing uh, rubrics which are already available I mean like prepared by the previous uh, lectures who have taught the courses before but then I was thinking only uh, how do we map the uh, I mean how can we create uh, the rubrics which can map which we can map with the PLO and CLO that we already uh, designed before, Prof. I mean, like uh, we want to, uh, we 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 create, a, a, we design a assignment or quiz for the students, and then how do we map assessment with the PLO and CLO which already defined before? Okay, thank you so much, Prof. All right, thank you very much. I think the PLO is the the program. Yeah, so program uh, is very huge. The program learning outcome is very huge. Um. It, it, it of course it aligns with your learning outcome for the course yeah so program learning outcome would have another rubrics uh, what is it that you want the students to achieve after five years that's your program learning outcome and you need to look at what you have determined for your group of students the cohort of the students according to this program but when you talk about the learning outcome that one is of course related to the course content and like you mentioned, yeah, you inherited the rubrics from, from the previous uh, instructor. So if, if you have inherited this uh, previous rubrics, is it going to be the same assignment? <clears throat> Are you going to be using the same assignment from the previous uh, instructor? But I believe that when you handle your class, yeah, you probably would want to have your own assignments uh, that you like to design because the way you teach, you know, certain contents would be more emphasized as compared to the other lecturers and so forth. So I would actually encourage you to look back at your contents, your assignments. If the previous assignment was good, then maybe you want to continue. If the previous rubric was good, you want to continue. But looking at the context of how we are now, um, as we come back from this pandemic, yeah, um, we are now looking at hybrid learning, right? Would this rubric be suitable yeah, when it was used pre-pandemic in a face-to-face -face situation? Like I mentioned just now, if you have less contact with the students, probably your rubric needs to be a little bit more detailed. So in a sense that coming up with your own rubrics is always the best, but it takes a lot of time. But once you have developed your own rubrics, you will find that marking is very easy, very fast, yeah, because it's just looking at the rubrics and then scoring them accordingly. So going back to your question, how do you align it? First of all, look at your program outcome. Program outcome would have a different set of rubrics compared to the one that you have for your learning outcome. And the learning outcome, that you, the, the, the rubrics that you inherited from the previous instructor, is it still usable? Is it still appropriate? If yes, go ahead and use it. But if no, maybe you want to change your assignments. I think for us, um, when you teach the same subject every year, for me, I've been teaching the same subjects every year. Yeah? Uh, my assignments are changed every two semesters because I noticed that if I have the same assignments, yeah, you will, the students will recycle the previous Yes, exactly, previous bro. Assignments, you know? uh, then it's better to change it. Just change a little bit and then maybe after the first, uh, first semester, second assignment, another assignment, third, uh, third semester, you could use the first assignment um, from the semester one. So that's how you change uh, the assignments, but not to reuse it the same all the while. That would be bad like, because students tend to do that. You will get from the seniors and sum submit the same thing as well. Okay, maybe uh, we should invite Prof to have a workshop <laughs> in uh, creating rubrics based on the courses that we teach. I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. Okay, any more question? Uh, Prof Wong? Yes, doctor. 
um, from your observations, um, which courses are using more analytical rubric and which courses use more holistic rubric? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I would I would foresee like um, Cursus University the the co curriculum they may they may uh, measure more on holistic uh, criteria or not necessarily. I think you are quite right on that when you talk about courses which are like Cursus Umum, um, which is not so specific in nature, and you have so many students here. Yeah? If you look yeah. at holistic and analytic will bring it. Holistic will make it if you grade students faster because you are just like looking at this person. Competent. Mm. Competent means 85%. If not, not, not competent, less than 50. So the number of students and also the nature of the subject would play a role in yeah. deciding whether you want to use holistic or analytic. Definitely, yeah. But using yeah. analytic, of course, there are more criteria to assess, but it is fairer in the sense that you are measuring um, quite specifically what is intended for this particular assignment. Okay, thank you, right. Prof. Thank you. Okay, so we have one question uh, from, ah, sorry. Okay, uh, Dr. Rosniza also uh, only thing. Uh, thank you for sharing, Prof. So, I have not used rubrics for formative assessment before. Uh, would you care to share some tips on using rubric for formative assessment? All right. Thank you for that question. Now, if you are going to use rubric for a formative assessment, it means that you need to grade that assessment during the semester you need to have enough time to give your students opportunity to look at the grade and perhaps improve on that assignment. That is a possibility. Yeah? But if you choose to do that, means that it's added burden on your side as an instructor. We want our students to improve. So let's say, for example, I give an assignment to my student. Then I say, you hand up by week five. I have to grade it very quickly, return to the student, student look at where are the weaknesses and then you give opportunity to, to the student to hand back the assignment to you with improvement. So that is something that you can consider. But I must forewarn you, yeah? if you have a big group of students, it means that there's two time marking there. Week five, students hand up, they do the correction, everything after based on your rubrics, yeah, what your comments, and then week 14, you grade them again. So if you're willing to do that, that is very good because it gives opportunity for the students to improve. That's the whole idea of doing formative assessment. Thank you for that question. So I think, uh, so any question? Okay, so maybe a normal question uh, from the participants. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for delivering very informative session uh, regarding the rubrics. Okay, hopefully what uh, Prof has shared today will be a guide for us to continue to provide uh, the best for UMT. On behalf of PPBI, uh, I would like to thank you for joining us today and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you again, Prof. Okay, before we end our session, uh, we will have a photo session. So, everyone, uh, please open your camera. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright, okay, Dila. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you very much, Prof.